Okay, are we on? Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Sadie Murdoch, and I'm an artist, and I also teach at Goldsmiths on the MFA Art, MFA Fine Art, and at Core Arts as well, which is a, a mental health arts charity in Hamilton. Uh, so, yeah, thank you, uh, Gro, for inviting me and allowing me to do this. And I'm going to talk to you, I guess, um, it's not the only book <laughs> that I thought of um, to introduce to you today about contemporary art. In fact, because of lockdown, I've been rereading a lot of my old art books and going through my sort of library. Um, but this was the one that really, for me, I thought would be great to introduce. And um, it's by uh, a guy called Michael Tossig. Tossig. And uh, it was published by the University of Chicago Press in 2009. And I read it when it came out uh, because I, um, I know the author. Uh, he was my landlord actually when I lived in New York for a year. So I was very excited to read it. And um, Michael Tossig, he, he is a, an Australian born anthropologist and he is the professor of anthropology at Columbia University. And he comes from what's called a tradition of reflexive anthropology, which is basically, it's like a form of study where you acknowledge the mutual influences. Um, so the subject of your study will be transformed by your encounter with it as the person doing the study. Um, and what the book is, it's a kind of, um, it's, it's quite layered and it's, it's a historical and structural analysis of colour. Um, and it, it deals with such things as like what he sees as a, a sort of Western aversion to bright colour. And then he takes this through a journey via colonialism, the physiological effects and ritual uses of colour and the act of creating itself. And this is why I think it's so interesting in terms of contemporary art. And he uses Walter Benjamin, Herman Melville, Vincent Van Gogh, um, Primo Levi, Bronislav Malinowski, Virginia Woolf, William Burroughs and Marcel Proust, uh, amongst others, as his guides through the, the terrain of colour. So it's really a book about the materiality and the unruliness of colour. And the, so why I chose it really was because it's, the book is an artwork. It's like, it is the thing that it's about in a way. And he writes a, um, a little bit like the colours that he's describing. Things, you know, the idea things overflow the text itself. And um, although a lot of the things he's talking about were made and written in the 20th century, it's really a book about the 21st century. So he examines the relationship between uh, us as human beings, uh, commodity fetishism, technology and nature in the age of global warming. So it's pretty, it's pretty broad. Um, and why I like it, I suppose this is where it kind of gets personal, is that I've always had this really ambiguous relationship to colour. And as an artist, like I guess my uh, default setting was black and white, really, from the early 1990s. And from like around 1990 to 2002, I made a series of um, black and white paintings uh, that were made using um, ink, black ink and detergent and white house paint. So I'm going to show you a couple of those now, if, um, if I can get the... If I'm going too quickly, uh, John, uh, just let me know, because um, I, I tend to steam through things sometimes. Yeah, so. uh, right, here we go. Uh, uh, just one second. Um, sorry, I did get these up on the screen. Uh, uh, okay. Um, So, um, <laughs> it says I'm now screen sharing. Now, uh, just, so. ah, I know what I've done. 
times in this room. Uh, right, it says screen sharing has failed to start. Um, I don't know why that is so. Hmm. Abby, are you, are you there? We've got, we've got a tech person in the background. Abby, do you? Oh, I am. Oh, okay. That's probably what's, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So uh, this is, um, sorry about that. Uh, so this is an example of uh, quite a large painting. It's about sort of two and a half, three meters high. Um, and it's made with uh, house paint, black ink and washing up liquid. Um, so I was painting like these sort of modernist interiors and they were made through a process of sort of staining and, and wiping, I guess. And the inky sort of blobs and splashes and stains were quite ambiguous. So I think I felt that if they were coloured, they would be too specific. Um, so red would look like blood and um, yeah, yellow would look like piss. And so I, I kind of wanted to lift them out of a kind of sort of specificity. So I felt that anything that's sort of splashed and smeared in a domestic interior sort of evokes the body. And yeah, more about that in a minute, I guess. Uh, so how do I get out of stop share? Okay, yeah, have I done it? Yep. Great, <laughs> okay. Um, and I suppose in some ways I saw like the black and white mode as a type of, um, a type of writing in a way. So uh, I'm gonna share one more image and I'm gonna kind of crack on with Michael Tossey, because I don't want to, I want to talk about the book really. Um, so, um, Yeah, we can see that, Sadie. Yeah? Yeah. That's done. Okay. Um, so this is another one from around like the same time. And um, yeah, they, they were really large. I guess I was sort of uh, thinking about kind of the tradition of abstract painting and kind of gestural um, abstract expressionism in some way. So the, the marks that I was making, I'm making were, they were sort of suspended really between something actual and real and something that was more like a kind of sign if you like okay right back to the book so um what uh, michael tussig really says is that, co that color is something a kind of intoxicating it's a type of physical presence or thing in the world and what he likes about it and what i also sort of like in terms of what he's saying is that it dissolves the distinction between subject and object and it has it's like something alive that has the power to activate and it's a sort of hybrid state between force and form so and I'm going to quote Tosnik here because this is a lovely quote he says that color is like another world a splurging thing an unmanageable thing like a prancing horse or a run in a stocking something formless that we always feel that we need to fence in with lines or marks, the boundary riders of thought. So he's basically sort of saying that colour is really unruly, it's like something out of control. And he also says that colour is not secondary to, to form, it's not an overlay draped over the object. And um, he says that it dissolves the visual modality, so as to become more creaturely and close. This is lovely. And it's something that can absorb the onlooker. It's a polymorphous, magical substance. It deconstructs form. And so here he brings in Walter Benjamin. Uh, and he says that in a child's view of colour, Benjamin says that, um, that children see colour differently from adults. And they see colour as fluid 
a medium of change. And he describes this instance in which a child saw not only a red butterfly, but red as butterfly. So, so the red was the butterfly. It's indistinguishable. So the thing is indis indistinguishable from the colour. Um, and he says that you cannot separate the colour from what it is a colour of. And it's the same for writing. So really, this is what's driving you know, the book, that he can't separate the way he writes from what he's thinking about colour. He just sort of, it's kind of ecstatic, actually. And there are passages that just like, I mean, they just go off the scale of some kind of beat poetry, in a way. Um, it's sort of the book that Rosalind Krauss would write if she, <laughs> if she was a beat poet and possibly a, a less repressed person. Anyway, um, so uh, Tossig then brings in uh, William Burroughs and uh, I, get to, I don't know if you've seen William Burroughs paintings, like the shotgun paintings that he make where he, uh, he fires a rifle, at, um, an aerosol kind of paint and it just kind of explodes all over the canvas. And there's a fantastic YouTube video of, of him doing that um, that I can find and share later. And he describes the the colour walks that William Burroughs and Brian Gissin took in uh, Paris and Tangiers. And in this extraordinary passage, passage uh, Michael Tossing describes how words flow from pages as colour pours from tar. Um, so tar, coal tar being like the black substance from which artificial dyes and colours are derived from. And he also describes uh, William Burroughs being like basically being kind of uh, having a kind of writer's block, he's sort of stuck. And um, there's a, an instance in which um, a black cat called Smoker creeps into the, the shack that he was living in by a railroad. And the, the black cat unblocks the writer's block because for William Burroughs, Smoker, the cat, is a creature of, light, of lightless depths who brings colour and light with him, with him as colours pour from tar. So the words pour pour forth from, uh, from this encounter. And he says that words for him are like animals, and that they're animals that don't like to be kept in pages, i.e. like in cages, cut the words up and let the words go through. So this kind of led him to his sort of cut up um, sort of technique, which is now kind of like, you know, very familiar. So color is invoked here to loosen the restraints of codes and conventions. And for me, this is like the, the point on which the, the book just becomes completely engaging. Like you're obviously you're in, into a discussion of colour that is not like, you know, I mean, in, if you think about David um, Batchelor's 2000 book, Chromophobia, which this book sort of acknowledges rather <laughs> kind of grudgingly, um, it, it sort of goes, it really kind of surpasses that. And, um, but he does, but Tossig does acknowledge that you know, there's a kind of hierarchical view of colour, particularly in the art world. So the less brightly coloured something is, the more cerebral and conceptual or kind of serious you know, it's supposed to be. So both Tossig and um, David Bachelor really talk about how colour is often dismissed as something decorative or superfluous or almost ornamental, a kind of add-on. And so this deep-seated antipathy to bright colour betrays a kind of fear and fascination. And it's not just about taste. It's something to do with various attempts to control and categorize vivid color, which, which has its roots in class struggle. Um, this idea of the vulgar, um, of the tacky, um, and, uh, and also in colonialism. So what Tossig then takes us on is like a trip through the history of the, the colonial history of color. Um, but going back to contemporary art, uh, I'll come back to colonialism in a minute, but the, one of the examples that he, am I kind of um, using up too much time here? No, I think it's fascinating. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, so one of the examples that I really like in terms of, like, I guess, the contemporary art is the description. It's basically about the, the first um, exhibition of colour photography as contemporary art, which was at the New, at New York's Metropolitan Museum in 1976. And it was an exhibition of William Eggleston's colour photography. Um, and Eggleston is a photographer that I adore. And the critics, one crit critic in particular, um, dismissed 
this exhibition as being associated with photography's most retrograde applications. So advertising, fashion photography, National Geographic. And so only black and white photo photographs were considered you know, to be worthy of the, the category of high art. Um, and then I was thinking about the way that white walls act to contain, if you like, sort of violent outbursts of colour in contemporary art. And contemporary art often plays deliberately on this arrangement. So you see work by, I guess, Ruby Sterling or Jeff Koons, or like, if you think about the US colour field paintings of people like Elton Kelly um, or pop art, where the rest, you know, I guess the <sighs> colour is a kind of a form of intoxicating wildness against the sobriety of the walls of the white cube. Um, so it's like things in a zoo, basically. <laughs> um, and I was thinking about like Jackson Pollock and the way that critics often liked his more sort of muted and restrained uh, paintings, the ones that had less colour in them, really. Yeah, you know, as if the ones that achieved the most achieved the most acclaim were the ones that kept wildness in check and were made more uh, sort of like articulate in inverted commas um, by these sort of muted greys and blacks and sort of ochres. So um, I guess sort of one more thing I'd like to say about this kind of uneasy relationship with colour is that colour is often seen as both deceitful and authentic. So um, the origins of the word colour come from, um, I made a note of this actually, from the Latin word silare, which means to conceal. And in Hebrew, it's similar. So zava is a word for colour in Hebrew, but zavua means deception. So, I mean, how can something be both truthful and deceptive? I mean, this is kind of interesting. And because if you say he shows, he or she shows their true colours, that means they're showing their true self. Um, so I was thinking about like the fantasy sequences in films and often like, I guess the, the obvious one is The Wizard of Oz where all the fantasy sequences in Oz are in vivid technicolor and then reality in Kansas is in gray. <laughs> and I also was thinking about my sort of early experience of color television, which I kind of dis disliked. I really liked black and white TV. Um, we didn't get a color TV until, I mean, I don't think we ever had one. I, um, until I sort of left home. And colour just seemed a bit added on and artificial and sort of like unnecessary. So, um, and Tossig, as you can imagine, has something interesting to say about this. And he says that early cinema and photography um, were often tinted and to, as he says, to the truth effect of film was added the deceit effect of colour, which is just like such a lovely kind of way of putting it. Um, so, uh, I guess, you know, even Joseph Albers, the Bauhaus colour theorist, uh, advised us that colour deceives continuously. So colour is like something really unruly and trustworthy and magical and, yeah, so this is really what Tosic is, is kind of saying. And towards the end of the book, it gets, it kind of becomes, um, I guess, darker in tone. And he talks about Bronislav Malinowski's immersive diaries, in which he describes Bronislav um, Malinowski was a, um, an anthropologist, a Polish anthropologist, who uh, went to uh, the Trobriand Islands in uh, just off the coast of Papua New Guinea. And his immersive diaries and photographs uh, reveal his encounters with the colours and the magic rituals of, um, of the indigenous peoples that he encountered there. And they draw out the problematic dichotomy that exists between the observer and the observed within anthropology. And so um, the photographs are kind of, they're quite striking. We have the, uh, you know, the, the European anthropologist in his sort of white suit, and then you have the indigenous people who, in the black and white photographs, you know, everything is in black and white. Um, but the colours kind of break through the, the, um, the academic and scholarly text. So he sort of goes on to really look at the colours, you know, uh, like commercial dyes, fabrics, um, 
He looks at uh, color in the colonial context and the relationship between slavery and color through the production and distribution and consumption of pigments and colored fabrics. And he also sort of talks about the, I guess, the inseparable question of, of what is colored and what is not colored. So the designation of people who are colored, people of color, and those who are without color, uh, and how this places and positions whiteness as standard, um, which now, you know, th you know there's, a, um, there's a lot of literature and sort of, uh, discussion really about like, notions of whiteness um, and as whiteness is sort of normative. So to think about colour is quite an interesting, like sort of, um, and there's a great book by, uh, it's, called, it's called White, and it is by, it'll come to me in a minute, <laughs> but I'll put it in the chat, which takes this through um, issues of film and television and uh, the early um, development of uh, the video camera. So, so lastly, uh, I'm going to show you a few more images of my own work, but I just wanted to uh, mention something that at the end of the book, um, Tosic uh, evokes Prima Levi, um, who was interned uh, in a concentration camp, and he was a chemist. And Tosic uses, uses this example to talk about artificial color, which comes from coal tar, and it's a chemical color. And he talks about the transition from the production of natural pigments um, to uh, what is described as aniline-based synthetic colors, um, which are a product of coal, where coal pours from tar, like smoky, smoke of the cat um, outside William Burroughs' shack. And how this led to organic chemistry and to the chemicals of IG Farben. Um, now, IG Farben were uh, a corporation whose chemicals were used to make colour film for cinema, artificial dyes, but also the artificial the, um, poisonous gas, Zycon B, that was used by the Third Reich in their extermination camps, and whose slave labour ran their chemical factories in Auschwitz. Uh, and Primo Levi was one of the, the chemists um, that was used in this labour force. So it ends in a, in a rather kind of um, sober way. Uh, in some ways, because um, colour you know, is part of the world. It has a, it's embedded within social, economic, political, um, as well as a, a sort of material history you know, of the Industrial Revolution, of colonialism. And it's also, um, I guess, Tosek sees it as a way of kind of understanding our responsibility towards the planet. Um, and it's quite a complicated <laughs> argument, but I, I'll, I'll leave that as a treat for you if you get hold, hold of the book. Um, it's, it's really, his description of, of, of how that operates is really quite something. Um, so I just want to quickly show you some images of um, some work I did that uh, going back to this question of colour, where I was kind, I was, after I sort of, um, I guess, moved more into photography as an artist. I still consider myself a painter um, and, and do now, like everything I do comes from painting. Um, but I was uh, exploring ways to kind of make black and white photographs using color film. So I was kind of going against the grain of you know, either actual color film or the, you know, a color setting on a digital camera. So everything in front of, in front of the camera um, was either painted or dyed uh, to appear as if it was black and white. Um, so you get, the, so in a way you're kind of going against the, the material grain of the um, photographic image. So if I do a little screen share here, I can show you some of those pictures. Uh, okay, so this is um, one from um, an exhibition that I did at the Henry Moore Institute in 2007. Um, so, yeah, yeah, we can see it. So that's great. Yeah. So, um, so it's it's I'm the figure lying on a chaise longue that was designed by Charlotte Perriand and Le Corbusier, 
and everything in the photograph is fake, like, but it's a kind of restaging of this iconic photograph. So I made this kind of um, constructed space and uh, I dyed the clothing um, and I smeared myself with black and white makeup. And you can see just kind of um, sort of where the hairline meets the neck, there's this sort of weird, sort of slightly pinkish area, which is where the makeup that I was wearing wore off. And one of the weird things about this image was that the, um, uh, I couldn't, although the makeup and the, the background appeared fine you know, on the photographic film, the, the dress and the tights were either purple or green because the camera, the sensors in the film were reading the chemical dyes in the fabric and misreading them. So I had to kind of re-dye everything to kind of uh, adjust to the chemical dyes in the um, photographic film itself. So there, there, there just were just some very weird things that kind of went on. And then halfway through the, uh, the photo shoots that I was doing, this kind of yellow um, band started to appear across the top of the photographs. So I just thought, oh my gosh, you know, what, the, what the hell is that? And then I realised that there was a big yellow sign above the glass roof of my studio and it was sending yellow light across the top of the photograph. So I had to, so in the end I put a big piece of purple cloth across the um, bottom of, of the window to kind of counteract the, the yellow and so everything went into neutral again. Um, so, so colour really was unruly and kind of out of control. Um, so this exhibition, uh, I'm going to do a screen share again. Uh, just one second. Uh, this is a, an installation view um, of the work in the Henry Moore Institute. So um, it was my choice to paint the walls this kind of bright magenta. Um, it's not actually it's not that bright. It's a it, but it was a kind of it's like a kind of um, um, Mark Rothko kind of mauve. I think, guess you could say. And it was deliberate. Uh, and then I'm going to show you. This is another piece. Uh, that I made, um, I'm, getting, I'm getting good at screen sharing now. Uh, right, this, is, this was a kind of experimental work um, where it's my body lying behind the framework of the chaise long. And um, so again, you can kind of see a face, a body, um, this reflective surface. And uh, I don't know if it's possible to see this, but my eyes, this sort of orangey red color, because the uh, I couldn't paint my eyes with black and white makeup, but also um, the makeup irritated my uh, retina. So I got this kind of stinging sort of red eye problem but I quite like that because it really it really showed up on the photograph uh, and uh, this is another one just for a second uh, yeah so this is the the other image that was in in the exhibition And I'm going to show you something from a recent show that I did. Uh, in Zurich, at the Muse Museum House Constructive, um, there was a show about Dada, and there were three uh, historical, I guess you could say, women artists um, in the exhibition and two uh, living ones. And um, yeah, uh, so this is called Rosebush Wheels 2. And it's a photograph of me wearing enlarged uh, photographic prints of various um, archival images uh, from the history of Dada um, and surrealism. And I'm holding a champagne glass that uh, has got 
a photograph of a sculpture that was made by Elsa von Freitag Loringhoven, um, printed and placed into the champagne glass itself. And the champagne glass, sorry, the, the sculpture was called a uh, portrait of Marcel Duchamp. Um, and if you, uh, I'll put a link to the, the exhibition uh, maybe in the, yeah, in the chat. Okay, I think that's enough um, of my artwork. I, I, I want to hear what uh, other people have to say about, I guess, the book and about, um, uh, and I'd like to hear what other people have brought to the discussion. That was brilliant, by the way. Yeah, I um, I, I love this book club because firstly, I'm all want to buy that book immediately you just talked about. And, but I also, even if I don't get around to it, you've just sort of educated us with all the best bits and, you know, learn a lot just by hearing you passionately talk about it. So thank you for that. Um, I've just got a quick, some practical questions about the book, actually. Um, I was wondering what year it was published. Um, I was wondering if there's any pictures in it. <laughs> um, <laughs> And um, I was wondering when you discovered it in your career and did it check, did you, was it, at what point did you discover it and did you suddenly introduce colour in or did how did it change what you were doing? Um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it does have pictures in it actually. It was published in 2009 and, but the pictures are, are, are in black and white. <laughs> Cause I guess the University of Chicago Press didn't have the budget. Um, but this is a this is a great picture. It's it's a, a Van Gogh drawing, and um, I don't know if you, if you can see that. Yeah. Uh, and in the drawing, he's although it's in black and white, uh, Van Gogh has written the colours into into the drawing as a kind of reminder, I suppose. Um, and yeah, there's there's a picture. Of, of the author, there you go, um, in a, a tent <laughs> somewhere. Um, and Tossig also wrote a great book called My Cocaine Museum, um, which if you, uh, if you like this book, <laughs> you'll love My Cocaine Museum. Um, and there, yeah, there's, there's a great picture of um, Malinowski actually, which kind of just, I mean, it's a shame that it's not in color because in a way, you would have the full force of what uh, Michael Tosic is talking about, but then maybe the text would be overshadowed by the unruly colour that he discusses. Um, so there's a great picture here, yeah, of Malinowski with um, the Trovi and Islanders. Um, if thoroughly fulfilling the conventions of. Um, conventional anthropological photography. Um, I guess, the, yeah, I mean, go, whoops, um, going back to, you know, why, yeah, at, my, at what point in my career, I mean, Michael was my landlord when I lived in New York when I was on the Whitney program. And so I was in, I was in New York from like September 2003 to uh, July 2004. And I showed him my work actually, and he, he did comment on the fact that I had, had sort of rejected any form of colour in my work whatsoever. He just said, what's that, what's that about? And at the time I thought he thought that it was down to my kind of repressed sort of Englishness, you know, that I was too uptight to use bright colour. Um, but I realised that he was, yeah, he was kind of gathering data and he lived in this extraordinary house, actually, on the Upper, upper West Side. And he let out rooms to me and a couple of other students. And every room was painted these bright colours. So my room was bright orange. And the living room was like a sort of cerise, sort of crimson. Um, and there were cats and children. And it was, it was like, it was quite a kind of wild place. And it was on, yeah, it was on the Upper, East, upper West Side, right by the river. It was amazing, actually. And so I guess when the book came out in 2009, I read it and I kind of started to think really, yeah, like 
what is it about like artists and color? And then David um, Bachelor's chromophobia fell into my hands. And he describes going to a curator's house where everything's in these kind of muesli shades of like gray and brown and whites. And you know, so, it's, so this question of taste, um, you know, that, that tastefulness, seriousness is somehow associated with a black and white register, you know, a more conceptual view on things, I think is, I thought was kind of interesting. And then he talks about the kind of like, color being somehow inappropriate, like it's fine to wear a, a brightly colored tie with a black suit, <laughs> but you don't wear a yellow suit with a black tie because it's, it's like weird. But it's sort of, so color has something that has to be kind of contained, you know, like, you know, if you get like, you know, the white cube, you know, which is the space of the, most exhibition spaces are white. So the colors pop and zing within their kind of cages. Um, and there have been obviously attempts to kind of subvert that by painting the walls different colors, but it always looks really staged and affected and self-conscious. And I think, yeah, I don't know. It's, I still have, you know, I still, um, I find colour has a very profound effect on me. I have synesthesia, um, so every day of the week has a colour, and, every, and numbers have colours. And I didn't realise it was some, it was a natural condition until um, until I was in my twenties, and someone else said they had it. But I was just thought it was a kind of quir a quirk. But I think so again, this is about the kind of the fact that you know that that colour walks up, walks. You know, through numbers, through words, through days of the week. You know, it just it has no boundaries. You know, it's um, it doesn't know its place. That's the thing. Color doesn't know its place. That's why I think it's interesting. Thank you for answering that. And a few um, a few posts have come through in the chat. I'm not sure if you can see them. But I can read them out to you if that's helpful. Oh yeah. Um, we've, um, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. A few I hope that's correct. Um, uh, if you said, uh, yes, I haven't read it. I hope that's okay. Um, and that's totally fine. In this book club, you don't have to have read it. It's just someone's talking about a passion. So if you don't want to go and want to read it, you can. Uh, Fia says, your passion for the book comes across and you've provided so many interesting points for thought and consideration. Thank you so much. Um, and we've got Simon Cole, who said, um, can you kindly explain to someone whose primary medium is words, why Walter Benjamin is so often quoted in visual arts. Thanks, great talk. And he's added, <laughs> I'm not as visually literate as some. Um, yeah, that's, that's an interesting question about uh, Benjamin. Um, yeah, I mean, Tossig's also written a book called Walter, ben Walter Benjamin's Grave, actually. So um, why is this? It, I guess it's, it, in some ways, he, you know, Benjamin has a, a aura of tragedy around him. Um, he died in terrible circumstances, um, but also his writing was kind of, it's about modernity and it's very pictorial as well. And he did write a lot about visual art. He wrote about surrealism, he wrote about photography. Um, he writes very vividly. He writes, he writes, I think, as artists write and, um, yeah, but I think it's, it, you know, he has a, um, a tragic sort of historical framework. Um, he died uh, uh, fleeing um, the uh, Nazi occupation of France, uh, and he died on the border between uh, France and Spain. And uh, at the time, they were only letting um, a limited number of people through the the border and it, it had been a very difficult journey for him to get there and when they got to the border him and his sort of compatriots um, the border was closed so he killed himself and the next day they opened the border so a whole a whole world of his writing was lost in one night and I think that some, you know, something about that is so sort of the unwritten, the unwritten. I, I just guess it's like it, for anyone who creates that's just that's just such a a kind of an apocalyptic kind of thing in a way. The un, these unwritten things, like what he, you know, what he would have written about had he experienced the rest of the twentieth century. So, but it's but he, yeah, it's the. Um, it is a good question. He's he's a kind of go to, um, you know, cultural theorist. Um, but he writes about you know 
modernity. You know, he writes about how we all got here in some ways. So. It's a good question. I've often thought that actually. <laughs> it pop up. I've wondered. Is is definitely a reference point. Um, Pete's just mentioned just a comment. Um, uh, wasn't it a singer, sergeant, or whistler? I get them mixed up. Who did? Who first did white galleries? Um, and Simon said, "Aha! I heard someone else talk about the enigma of the unwritten." Thanks. So I think you've. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't. Um... I mean, it's, it's actually a really easy book to read. It's kind of, if you haven't read it, it's not going to, you know, it's not taxing at all. It's, um, you know, it, it reads like, it's like reading, it's not journalistic. It's more, um, he brings you with him. He doesn't allow you to fall behind. And, you know, there are some writers that it's like chewing concrete, to be honest. Like, you, you know, you're really sort of, you know, struggling with the jargon and the terminology but there's 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 none of that in this it's a it's a breeze to read and it, it's it's kind of um it, tra it transports you and it also makes you really excited about making art it just sort of you realize you know that you know what materiality is and what materiality 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 can do um actually the book that i'm uh, if i type in the um chat box, I guess you'll get it. The book I mentioned about whiteness in the film is by uh, Richard Dyer. Um, I don't know if it's, if it's still in print, um, but he talks about the construction of whiteness in, in cinema. Um, and he talks about, about this idea of colour as well. You know, that, um, and whiteness is a type of purity um, and he just takes that to pieces it's, it's kind of wonderful thank you i mean that's um that's the questions in the chat oh, uh, but pete had a question i um, don't know the answer is i don't know <laughs> i don't know i think it was i can't remember which the, one of they're both a bit flash americans when i think the singer sergeant i think they he was one that he was the first person to actually just paint the galleries. Why didn't he do a lot of white paintings and stuff like that? And it was really early, like Edwardian times. And I don't think anyone had I think galleries were a bit like the National Gallery is now, you know, with different slightly muted kind of colours or red walls or and I think he just kind of really blew everyone away. And that that's like the first white gallery or something. Yeah, I don't I don't know about that actually. That's I mean it's I mean I was thinking, yeah, it's interesting that the phobes you know, who used the brightest colours of the, you know, the early 20th century painters were called the wild beasts. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, you know, that's wild, I mean. <laughs> I mean. Um, but yeah, I don't know about the, this white space. Like, there's, there's a book by um, Inside the White Cube by uh, Brian O'Doherty, which um, describes the evolution of the, the convention of the, the white gallery space, because it didn't always used to be that way. But it's definitely a 20th century, you know, a late a 19th, early 20th century phenomenon. Yeah, you know, the idea is that the, you know, the work, um, in a way, what white galleries do, white, white wall galleries do, is they decontextualize artworks. You know, they take them out of the artist's studio and they place them, you know, in a, in a, um, a zone where they can't be interfered with, you know, they, or they can't escape. You know, they're sort of, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very, it's a very effective way of presenting an image because there's nothing to interfere with it. There's nothing to distract, and you can, you know. But it's really, you know, the development of the white gallery space is linked to the evolution of modernism and a kind of Greenbergian idea that the painting is um, contained within its kind of rectangular frame, and everything you need to know about it is within that frame. So, um, you know, the kind of composition, the colours, the form are all about the relationship of those elements to the to the edge. So you've got something in the way. You know, like there's nothing worse than like shiny paintings because then you can see yourself in it. <laughs> this is like like the Greenberg's nightmare. <laughs> yeah, they didn't really have varnishing day. The abstract expressionists did. They? <laughs> exactly, they had dumping. Yeah, dumping down. Um, I don't know. I suppose this takes me back to you know. I guess when I was a, a student at Chelsea and um, you know, the development of abstraction and yeah. But that's a, that's another story. Um, yeah, 
Yeah, um, I'd, I'd like to hear what other books people have brought to the book club. Um, Pete, anybody? Juliana? <laughs> I was just, go. Go I, was just looking, I was just looking up who, why, when did they start becoming white galleries? This whole, whole article here, if you just Google it, it tells you. Okay. <laughs> it's a massive long article, so I can't tell you. Yeah, but it was, you know, yeah, the 19, in the 1970s, yeah, when modernism started, they started being painted white. Before that, they were coloured. <laughs> um, well, when did modernism start? I mean, that's... Well, I don't know, he says the 20th century here. <laughs> Early 20th century, it became white. <laughs> but it's a really long article, so I was like, oh, I've got to quickly find out. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, I've put the link. Because before, they were always in churches and so on, early on. So, yeah. Yeah, or in salons where... Yeah, um, and the salons were kind of, you know, thick. They were often painted. They were had yeah. Yeah, painted colours. And, th and, and also they were often painted, you know, there was a salon hang where you had like, yeah. like they do with the Royal Academy Summer Show, um, which is a, um, yeah. harking back to that convention. But, so um, it's, it's early 20th century is what they come up with. <laughs> doesn't give an exact date. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, you were asking about... Um, books um yeah the most recent one i i got was um a kind of cartoon history of the artemisia gentileschi story and i thought that was quite fun <laughs> it's just like a like a like a yeah cartoon manga artemisia gentileschi which i thought was kind of um quite interesting for a younger audience as well to get into understanding kind of older art so that was quite fun is it in color uh no it's in black and white. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> the color is in beautiful color and then you go in you think no it's just all black and white manga <laughs> without the color yeah <laughs> they're kind of you know really interesting i never <laughs> thought of her as a kind of so, some sort of manga character <laughs> no that's not the first thing that springs to mind definitely <laughs> um, yeah. It's a good way of rewriting history, well, writing history uh, for a, a, a larger audience. Um, yeah, sorry, that was my last art book. <laughs> hey, Julia, when you've got a moment, if you can pop it in the chat, because I'd like to, I, I couldn't take a note of it quick enough, or, or could you say the artist again so I can pop it in the chat? Oh, yes, oh. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go and get the author. It's upstairs. I'll, I'll run upstairs whilst... You're all chatting, and then I'll type mm. it in. <laughs> I'll share it on, on Facebook. Yeah, yeah, I will. Yeah. Um, Pete, did you want to go, or do you want me to? Or is yeah, it... I'll go. Um, I'm going to share screen because the book. I'm not actually in. I'm not anywhere near my books. All these books aren't mine. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I have to pretend, have to pretend <laughs> they are. Yeah, it's my library. You know, I'm, I'm, you spoilt it now, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> no. it's, my, it's my standard Zoom background to make myself look intellectual. <laughs> so the, let's see if you can guess who it. Let me see from photos. Keep current selection. That was the wrong one. Let's try again. Oh, God. Hang on. I, like everyone else, is um, allow Zoom to... Uh, uh, hang on. God, why isn't it... I think you have to... Oh, I know. Okay. Yeah, no, no, no. Give me, give me one oh, second. Right. Give me one second. Um, I, know what, I know what it's doing. It's because I usually... You've got to have it open already on your computer screen to be able to share it. You there still, Pete? <laughs> um, just checking to see, we haven't lost you, Pete, while you've been pressing buttons. And if so, I can jump in and do mine while he's um, 
wherever he is in cyberspace. Uh, Sadie, should I jump in if Pete? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I wasn't sure if we'd, would we, if I'd gone or he'd gone. Um, I'm going to jump in, then Pete can do it when he comes back. Um, so I um, have, I really, really enjoyed hearing about your book, and I, and I really want to get it because the way you described it felt engaging and easy to read. And one of the things I struggle with, with contemporary art, art history, and all that is the academic sort of literature, which I. I've got loads of books on and I get through the first so a couple of pages and sort of then put it down expecting to pick up a note later date and I, and I don't. So I really need something engaging to keep me occupied. Um, and I actually sort of cheated a little bit with my with my book because, well, I feel like I've cheated, but maybe I haven't, I don't know. I've, I've, I've chosen um, Sophie Cowell's uh, 2017 book, um, Rachel Monique. Um, and it, it, this is a, um, I've chosen it, not because of its kind of, um, it's because it's a special book, it's a gift. And it's a, it was a gift to me by um, a collaborator of mine, uh, Moe Seki, Seika, uh, Sakika. And um, we worked together um, over a couple of years period and she's a photographer. And uh, she went to Paris and uh, she came back and she always gives me gifts, which is why she's, one of the reasons why she's a lovely friend. It's actually signed uh, Paul Jordana is it you from Sophie Cowell? Um, and it's very hard to actually sort of show on Zoom. Um, and this is where it would be nice to meet in person. But it's an embroidered book. Um, and this is all the, 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 the that's all embroidered. Um, actually, I, I almost worry when I touch it because I feel I might drop it on something or spill something. It's almost like I don't want to kind of, uh, don't want to kind of touch it or drop it or ruin it anyway but it's actually just a completely uh, a beautiful piece of a treasure in its own right and I actually kept it wrapped up for ages and why I've chosen it for a contemporary art book club is it it sort of embodies art in itself it's a piece of work in itself it's actually about um, the uh, photo photography that Sophie Cowell an archive collected uh, during um, over the years uh, relating to her mother and her mother passed away in 2007 2007 um, and it hasn't got um, it's actually interesting you're talking a sort of about monochrome and color in the white space because every page has got white space and monochrome and there, there's a few touches of color but it's photography and it's it, it, uh, it's got excerpts um, connected to the photography um, and it, it sort of embodies what I feel you know contemporary art is and a, you know talking about how um, it sort of embodies it rather than talks about it and tries to articulate it and that's when I was doing my master's and you know really enabled me to embody being an artist and stop trying to be kind of academic about it you know and the, the thinking and feeling became um, more important than the sort of trying to articulate it I mean that's why I sort of identify with Simon's you know reference of Walter Benjamin sometimes it's easier to kind of um, engage with a book rather than try and sort of learn from it and therefore you're learning at the same time um, so it's definitely one that I would recommend. It isn't one I would buy because I, I would imagine it's quite expensive. Um, and it was a real, it was a gift and I treasure it very much. I don't know how much it would be to buy, but in relation to my, my mum, when I saw her a couple of years ago and I bought it, went through it together and we looked at it and kind of like really sort of bonded over the experience that she had with her mum and the photography. So as a, as a contemporary art book, I would really, you know, as a gift or something to engage with, I, I would really recommend it. Um, but I think it's definitely one that you kind of need to see perhaps off Zoom and, and touch and feel because, yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's tactile and it's gorgeous. And yeah, that's why I would put it on my coffee table above everything else, because although you'd have to wear gloves to touch it, unfortunately, so... But yeah, that, that would be uh, my book and I, I thoroughly recommend it to anybody for kind of uh, yeah. dealing with the themes of grief and kind of just, yeah, someone experiencing their life through art. Was it a limited edition book? 
Is it like a limited print? I think it probably is. A, I mean, it was it was just a, a lovely moment to receive it. It was something yeah. expected. And I think she just made a lot of effort to queue up and buy it and meet Sophie. Um, but yeah, I've never Googled it because I don't want to know how much it was cost because I don't, I don't want to know how much she spent because she shouldn't have done it. But yeah, it's uh, I suspect it is. Um, but yeah, it, it covers a lot of themes, but in a very experiential way. So I would recommend it, absolutely. Yeah, it's interesting how you become attached to books. Like some people just, once they've give, read the read books, they just give them away. Or I can never understand people doing that. Like, I mean, my bookshelves are groaning with <laughs> with books read and unread. And I, I, I it's really hard to, you know, because they become part of you. Like they, you know, especially if you're a kind of messy reader, you know, you kind of you know, break the spine and, you know, turn over the pages and make scribbly notes with pen and pencil. Like they, they be, yeah, they, they have this kind of very intimate relationship to your, your life in a way. And um, so I, th I think that's one of the solaces of lockdown, being in lockdown in a way, is like you, you kind of, you're forced to, you've been forced to confront this kind of archive of one's sort of knowledge and experience. And, and where, but also every time you open the book, you, you remember, like, I guess, yeah, how you came about it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for listening. Uh, it's nice to, to get it off and uh, get it off the bookshelf and bring it back and I shall enjoy it again over the next couple of days. Yeah, there's, a, there's a great, it, it's a, it'd be a, a lot cheaper. Um, there's a great book which you uh, published called Sweet Benicienne, um, where the artist follows um, a stranger, a guy around Venice, and mm -hmm. he, he, he stalks him, basically. Yeah. Uh, and the book is, is all full of the description of her doing that and the photographs of the, the man and she really did it so it's kind of a reversal of I guess the normal stalker and stalked relationship um but it's not it's not sort of creepy and no. weird it's just, it's very very sort of moving um yeah I really relate to sort of the documentation of life that's what she you know that's Sophie Cowell and other works yeah I just enjoy that documentation rather than kind of um you know just living living it um, did I hear Pete's voice? Did, did he come back? Yeah, I'm back. I, it, it made me log out of, it logged me out of Zoom. I think I've changed my settings. Let's try again. Hold on. Oh, yeah. Okay. Can you see that? Yes. So this, I mean, it's the other end of the spectrum, you know. Um, I just thought I'd share it this book because um, somebody bought him in, in, in Berlin a couple of years ago or a year and a half ago. I can't remember the last year. It's gone completely in a book. Um, I, it, it's something I've always been fascinated by as a book. And it was a really nice edition of it, which I'll share the edition. Um, and um, it, it's this one, and it's Marionetti's Futurist Cookbook. And I just thought, because everyone's cooking at home at the moment, you know, everyone's, you know, everyone's sharing their creations, aren't they? Um, on um, Instagram and social media, and um, and this is a really nice edition of it. And I, I kind of, it's problematic, isn't it, um, Marionetti? He's, um, he's. Um, you know, he wasn't a quasi-fascist. He actually was a fascist. You know, and he, and, and there's a there's a, there's a citation in there. You know, it's one of the, you know, if you want a, a citation, it's it, Mussolini's. This is one of the best books I've ever read, kind of thing. You know, which is pretty awful. And um, he was, you know, and he wasn't. I think he was quite. He was a bit of a joker, but he comes across as a bit of a rich kid who's kind of playing around and had amazing ideas, but was was pretty unpleasant. You know, he's an opportunist, anti-Semitic kind of character as well. And, you know, and he wasn't he wasn't um, the kind of person you'd really want to get snug, snuggled up to, really. But um, I think I think the, the, the kind of, um, you know, the sort of thing that the relevance of it now, although it was written about 100 years ago, is, you know, he has these kind of, these ridiculous, seemingly ridiculous recipes, you know, like it's militaristic, it's nationalistic, it's kind of eccentric and, and kind of studiedly eccentric, I guess. But he kind of says things like, you know, there's recipes like raw steak 
with accompanied drum roll, you know, and pasta is no food for fighters. He wanted to abolish pasta, you know, like deliberately, you know, provocative, of course, because Italy's national dish is probably, you know, I mean, it made headlines in the kind of um, American press, you know, the Italian who wants to ban pasta, you know, is a brilliant publicist. But he also said things like ice cream on the moon, which is, you know, you, I mean, you can buy like astronaut food, can't you? This frozen kind mm. of this freeze dried ice cream, candied ac- atmospheric electricities, um, sculptured meats and nocturnal love feasts. Um, and, and, and these kind of rules of rules of engagement, if you like, were, were I think a battery of scientific instruments in the kitchen, ozonizers to give liquids and food the perfume of ozone, ultraviolet ray lamps, um, preventing rickets in young children, etc. Electro electrolytes, so decomposed juices and extracts, in such a way as to obtain a known product, a new product with properties. Colloidal mills to pulverize flowers, dried fruits, drugs, etc. Atmospheric and vacuum stills, centrifugal autoclaves, dialyzers. The use of these appliances will have to be scientific, you know. And I think the kind of the kind of thing he was leaving, you know, the, the thing it's been picked up is Heston Blumenthal, isn't it? You know, absolutely that kind of cooking in the nineties through to now which is like, you know, um, El Bulli in, in, um, in, you know, the Catal- this Catalan-, Catalan restaurant in Barcelona, the new Nordic cuisine where you, you know, everything's kind of like this, you know, like a, a, a kind of, um, you know, a, a, a piece of moss with a kind of odour of kind of sea with a kind of, you know, something on top of that or definitely like Heston Blumenthal where he kind of like creates these kind of scientific things with dry ice pouring off. I think they were, I think they were in, incredibly influenced by, by this book. Um, and, you know, like if, if anything had to come through about futurism, I mean, it, it, it seems odd that, it, you know, like a lot of it was, you know, they, they tried to attempt to, uh, you know, um, make musical instruments that kind of, they didn't work as, as well as, you know, they were very much before their times. Um, they tried to represent movement and, you know, kind of didn't really work that well. And this kind of thing actually probably is like something that did come true in a, in a, in a weird sort of way. Um, and finally, I mean, Mari- Marionetti was, was a joker and a kind of eccentric and everything, but he didn't have a great deal of humour about himself because somebody took that photograph in 1935 and we were just pigging out on a lot of spaghetti and and uh, rather than him sort of um, kind of like brushing it off as a joke and that he, he was really furious and he tried to kind of deny deny it was a real photograph he said it was a fake fake news fake photograph and that so he was a bit sensitive about his uh, his image as well and you know that you know not a great character but a, a really interesting odd book I think that's it. Yeah, futurism is a, is a, a kind of, in the history of modernist painting, it's, it's kind of a weird one, isn't it? Like, you, you don't really, art historians don't, re, don't really know where to put it. Like, they slot it in after cubism and then sort of rush on quickly <laughs> onto something else. <laughs> yeah, they, they, kind of, they kind of missed out the whole of the 30s and 40s, which is, you know, like, <laughs> I mean, it wasn't, I don't know, it, it, it's, it's not a, it's not a move, it's not a PC movement, is it? They weren't very nice people, were they? they wanted war and kind of, they were that selfish kind of greedy kind of culture. But I guess, like David Stubbs we had mm-hmm. on the other night talking about electronic music and he talks about in his book, Mars by 1980, about the futurists were really... A, in their in their musical kind of ideas, they're really ahead of the times. They're envisaging machines that could kind of collect all the sounds and give them to everybody and be controlled by one person. I guess you know their ideas were better than their kind of work, really, weren't they? You know. Yeah, I think that the manifestos are kind of quite interesting because they they did some quite interesting things in sort of typography. Um, yeah, yeah, the type of is amazing, but, isn't it? But I think the paintings, uh, I suppose that they're just sort of struggling with a, with a language that isn't, isn't doing what they want it to do in a way. Like it's kind of, 
they're sort of weighed down by the baggage of European painting. And they're quite, I find them, find them quite funny in a way. They're kind of, <laughs> it's like the, um, the sculptures are better. Film was already doing it though, wasn't it? We want to show movement, like film it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess it had been, you know, been supplanted by, by, ironically, by technology, which they, they worshipped. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It's, yeah, it's a sort of weird... Yeah, Italian modernism is quite a weird one. There's a kind, there's a, when I was in, in Rome, I did a, a piece of work about uh, AUR, which is like um, a kind of modernist fantasy city that Mussolini built just outside um, yeah. The, yeah, the city of Rome. And it's kind of, it's, there's this extraordinary building called the Square. It's known as the Square Colosseum. It's like something from a De Chirico painting. And, um, it, you know, he only got a certain, yeah, he didn't get all the way through because um, he was assassinated. So, but the some of the building carried on. So a lot of the buildings are complete now. It's like a wealthy suburb of Rome. It's really, it's mm. really a, eerie and uncanny. It's like um, it's like being trapped in a kind of surrealist, modernist, futurist yeah. nightmare um, where everyone's that's, sort of skateboarding and <laughs> eating. Well, that's what that's what the East. Outside. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That, but, that's what the East Village is like in um, in, um, in in kind of um, the other side of the Olympic Park. It's all this kind of yes. I I, yes. I, I, I gave a drawing to the um, I think it's called Article Twenty Five, which is like the the Architects Association or the AA or whatever they're called. Or um, they have a they do a charity auction every year, and I submitted it with a text underneath it, which was something about what is this kind of thing that looks like I can't remember the, the name the arch, name, architect's name but looks like the Italian fascist architect combined with Minecraft or something like that you know and it's kind of that's what this stuff looks like isn't it so yeah it also looks a bit like Los Angeles but done over by <laughs> kind of um, the Third Reich or something it's just yeah little, um, yeah it's, it's uh, that's yeah era not um, not Hackney Wick <laughs> That's how you written something else. It's like a sort of, it's like a film set, a, a dystopian <laughs> sort of. I don't know. Yeah, well, it's uh, uh, it's sort of ch it's changing, I guess, all the time. I bet it's changed. When was the last time you went there? I get, sometimes I go through it on the train going to Corrats. Um, right. So I just see a limited sort of sort of strip of it, yeah. uh, but. Yeah, it does. It does feel like um, it feels quite stagey. Um, I suppose it's like fast track gentrification. That's what. Yeah. That's what. Um, that's what it looks like. Yeah, I mean, we've got that going on here in Deptford, just sort of you know, around the corner. But it's, um, I think Deptford's a bit harder to gentrify. But they're yeah. working on. <laughs> they're working on it. Um, but you can just, you know, yeah, it's still. It's kind of lovely here, actually. You've got the kind of because we're the, the uh, art college is um, between the creeks, two creeks of Deptford Creek, and then there's like loads of people living in boats all in the creek, and it feels quite kind of laid back and sort of yeah. I mean, the building's a bit like sort of studios you had when you first left college, so yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's quite nice. Here, but, That's good. But, but yeah, anyway, I'm getting off the point. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sadie, that there's been a couple more comments in the in the chat. Um, Afua, am I? How do you pronounce your name? Do you mind? I don't want to be saying it wrong. Um, hi, uh, hi, Jordana. Uh, yeah, it's Efwa. Yeah, Efwa. Yes, F I, I was just um, saying I, I did read very slowly, and I don't read very often actually. So I'm pleased that it's a book about art and it's called The Lonely City by Olivia Lang. And um, that actually talks about the gentrification of uh, New York, um, what happened to Times Square uh, under Giuliani. And um, uh, there's a lot of really beautiful exploration of, of various artists like David Ronovovich, Ronovovich and... Um, um, but it's through the, the lens of her experience of 
it's you know of, of being very isolated and sort of looking at their work and life and seeing how it their their it, her loneliness sort of resonates with their loneliness and how that helps her sort of find some way through this sort of city life that she's exploring. And I, I just really like the way that um, um, uh, Sadie was talking about this book she was reading, the sort of layered nature of it and how, how sort of beautiful that is, the way she was talking about um, when she was a student and um, the effect of this house uh, that you know the, how that house had this effect on her um, and I really I really enjoyed that but anyway Olivia Lang book is feels like a very sort of and it's it talks about the pandemic of AIDS well uh, you know AIDS and its effects and um, how you know how resonant that is with what, what we're undergoing now so, yeah, it's a really beautiful book, really. I, I find it really hard to read, actually. We're talking about reading things. I find all books incredibly difficult. I find it very hard to get the focus to, to read. So, um, yeah, it was a really sort of, it was a lovely book, yeah. When was it published? Um, it's quite recent, I, I think. Um, the last 10 years, I'm not entirely sure. Um I, I never, I don't really look at things like that because I'm not <laughs> an academic, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a fairly recent book. A friend sent it to me, yeah. Okay, I'll check, yeah, I'll check that out. Yeah. It sounds really good. Yeah, I think, I think that, I, but it also what you were saying made me reflect upon like colour, um, how, because I went to art college with Pete and how little I knew or still know about colour. It is the most mysterious of subjects. You know, there's so many ways you can kind of try and get hold of it. And, and you were talking about it being a sort of unruly, evasive kind of topic. And it's so interesting that sort of, again, that sort of lens to see the world history anthropology through this lens of colour is what you, it just made me sort of think a lot about how at art college, we're not really sort of taught very much at all in a way. And I, that's okay, actually, I quite like that. But, um, uh, but, but now I'm doing a sort of very sort of like, really sort of tight painting and I'm sort of trying to find out about how you, use colour and it's a sort of massive revelation to me you know and I went to art college 30 you know 40 years ago or whatever anyway I'm rambling now but there we are but it's very it's a lovely talk yeah thank you yeah thanks I, I think we get taught colour theory at some point um you know which is <laughs> um, so but that's about it <laughs> yeah and it's a very, I mean, some of the colour theory we're taught is actually kind of erroneous. It's just that we've all become, to, we all accept that that is the story. It, but there are different ways of looking at it, um, mm -hmm. depending on cultural cultural things. But it, yeah, so we think we know, we think we have a handle on it. And actually, it's a very slippery subject. Yeah, I mean, it's. I think this is why... I mean, the book actually, you know, the title of the book, What Colour is the Sacred? I've always thought it's slightly clunky, actually. Like, it, um, and I don't really understand. Yeah, it, it, it comes from a discussion about um, kind of ma magic rituals, really, in the sacred. And, like, does the sacred have a colour? I think at some point, Tosic asked this. Like, but then I suppose it's, a, it's about something that is not ineffable but it, it's something that's very hard to kind of pin down like how I mean we all experience colour differently I think that's the thing like it's, it's incredibly sort of subjective um, and it's hard to agree on colour like it's quite you know um, and it also it's so attached to the body you know that depending on you know, if you close one eye, then close the other, usually you'll see two different types, very 
subtle differences in shades in, in color because you know in, in a sense color is just our experience of it like i mean things things don't actually have color it's just light it's just refracted light so then it's really about the bodies that we have and, the, and what we're able to see so i found that um if you think about it that way, then you know, color is really just you know, a type of experience. Um, so it's, yeah, but there are, you know, there are some kind of rules, <laughs> if you like, you know. The opposite of red is green and all that. I do, you know, I do those drawings with color, four color kids pencils. I've been doing them for like 25 years. And everyone says, oh, wow, what lovely colours. You're the only person who actually said, it's like monochrome, really, isn't it? It's all the same. It's just, it's the same. You're the only person in 25 years who's actually said that, it, yeah, it's not really colour, is it? Because it's, it's, it's a random four colours and they're always pretty much the same colours unless they mix a bit. And it's like... Yeah, that's sort of like, that it's like every colour, so it's none. Yeah. Uh, which is light, I suppose, like, yeah. or, or darkness, depending, if you use, you know, depending on what palette <laughs> one, one is using. Um, I think, yeah, and also colour always comes in the form, and like it's, it's, you know, it's often bought commercially, like paints or, you know, pencils or crayons, or clothing, everything is dyed or tinted, like it's, like all colour has a materiality, like it, it's sort of, there's no pure anything it's it's all it always comes from material base whether it's kind of an earth pigment or a chemical dye or you know so it, it's or it's embedded in things like you know the color of light color of the sky color of the sea you know so color is you know color is in the thing itself it's inseparable it's not it's not an abstract thing i think that's often a, a um, I think that was a kind of revelation for me with the book i suddenly thought like actually every color is a thing but everything has a colour, and somehow you can't take that apart. I just thought that's you know it, it, it's a, it's really a sort of critique of, of you know binarisms, which is how we build language and how we build you know categories within the world, like you know not this but that or male female up down black white, you know. But but the world the, the world isn't constructed that way. Like these binaries are just our way of kind of navigating it. But the kind of dualities that we're imposing on the world just, you know, they just fall apart under, you know, under scrutiny. And I suppose that that's what, I mean, this book, you know, doesn't even have to say that because it's kind of, <laughs> it is the thing itself. Um, and, but I do, I do think there's something about, yeah, I think also under lockdown, our experience of the world has just been something else entirely. And I think, so for me, this book just seemed like the right book to read, you know, when, you know, it opens up another another world, another time. It's like time travel. But it also, when you look at the world after you've read the book, like I remember lying in Hagston Park in Hackney after reading the section on on Proust and Van Gogh and about, I'd just been reading about uh, Van Gogh's painting of Blossom, Cherry Blossom. And I was sitting under a Cherry Blossom tree and I was looking at it and it just made sense. You know, like somehow, like colour is this kind of polymorphous sort of plasma, like, you know, I was part of the thing I was looking at and it was part of me. It's sort of, it, you know, it was like a sort of revelation. And I think yeah, our relationship to the world is really, it's become more intense in a, in a way, you know, um, our sort of experience, you know, like everyone says like, oh, last year's spring was extraordinary because we were all in lockdown. There was nothing else to do apart from look at the natural world. And so kind of here we are again. And, but we're a bit, you know, it's different now because I think we see the end coming. We come hungry for it, but I, I think it's still, yeah, it's still really good to sort of slow down and look and think and feel and experience colour. It's like, it's like Dennis Potter in that South Bank show interview when he's just sort of swigging morphine from a hip flask and he's he's on the way out and he says and he and he sort of like gets a cigarette and he said, "What a parcel of delight this cigarette is!" and then he says. I look out of the window, Melvin, and, you know, Melvin Bragg, and he says, I look out the window and I just look at the blossomness of the cherry and I just think what, you know, all I can think about is its blossomness, you know. And it's, yeah, it's that's exactly it. That's beautiful. Exactly it. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, I really, rec yeah, recommend the book. And it's, it's really, it's, 
it's not a hard read at all. It's just like a, you know, it's gripping. You know, it's like a, it's liter- it's like literature. You just fall into it, and you know, he carries you, you know, through it, um, and doesn't let you, doesn't let you fall. That's what I like about it. Um, yeah, he's an int- a very interesting writer. Um, it's yeah, he does write a lot about art actually. You know, uh, he's sort of part of you know, I guess the New York, the New York kind of art and culture theory scene, and um, yeah, so a lot of his work really comes from thinking and writing about art. Anyway, Eddie, I'm just. Um, gonna- Sorry, I'm just going to chip in quickly with, uh, I, n- I know we're running short on time, but Simon Cole, um, who we know well at Grow, said, to be fair, The Lonely City is your favourite book of the last few years. So, Simon, I, I will post that. If, unless you want to say some words quickly now, I will share that on the group. Um, but feel free to say anything about that book. Um, and um, Pete said, uh, I found a copy of, Chevriel, first copy US edition in Oxfam when I was a student and sold it 20 years later for £485. So, um, (laughs) (laughs) entrepreneurialism there as well. But yes, I I, I think, um, do speak up some if you want, otherwise we we will just post up your your, your book recommendation through the group. Uh, No, I think think if we did it nicely, thank you. I don't think I could really add much to that. Thank you. So, um, okay. so this, I mean, thank you so much for that was just engaging and um, fascinating. And, you know, the, sometimes I buy a book I'm recommended, sometimes I don't, but it sounds like that is a book to read. And, um, you know, this this session's meant to be accessible to people who either know art well or, are, you know, just new to it and just want to find that first book that they, you know, can start with. And it sounds like that book is uh, accessible and, um, you know, anyone can pick up and add to their, their, their shelf. Um, so thank you so much to for, for sharing that with us and giving us all your time and expertise and experience and learning more about you as an artist as well is a real treat for us. And um this will be uh, archived in the Grow at Home series, so people can um, read more. And also, the recommendations of all the books will be posted on our social media. Um, and it's supported by the Arts Council. And the idea is that um, whilst we can't be together in person, we can um, be together online. And it, you know, it doesn't replace being on being together, but it certainly, you know, is connecting and enjoyable. And it. At moments, it does feel like we're sat having a drink, a a coffee or, or, you know, a glass of wine and just sharing what people are reading and, you know, the recommendations. Um, I mean, obviously, I let you conclude. I just wanted to sort of say that there was another one um, which we're going to hold in March. And this is uh, if you only read one book, uh, book club and the subject's actually craft with um, a local craftivist and uh, passionate sewer as well as artist um, on the 16th of March. I just wanted to do a little plug in case you know of any craft fans out there do tell them um but yeah i don't know if you had anything you wanted to to keep going there sadie but well, just, you know on behalf of grow i did just want to thank you very much and i'm sure the rest of the participants in this session would like to thank you as well no that's yeah thank you thank you for letting me do this thanks um, brilliant thank, thank you. you that was great okay well have a enjoy your evening everybody um Thank you, Sadie. Thank you so much. And yeah.